Very few of our natural resources can be taken directly from the earth and used as final products. We need plants and mills and refineries to process raw materials so that they can be used by consumers. How materials are processed depends on what they started out as and what they're supposed to become. The process of changing materials from one form to another is what chemistry is all about. By understanding chemistry, you can better understand how raw materials are processed. In order to discuss chemical equations, we need to begin with a definition of a chemical reaction. A chemical reaction is a reaction that forms a chemical bond, breaks a chemical bond, or simultaneously forms and breaks chemical bonds. A chemical equation is basically a description of a chemical reaction in the form of symbols and numbers. Let's take a look at an example of a chemical equation. This equation represents the chemical reaction between copper and sulfuric acid. In this or any other chemical equation, the starting materials or reactants and the products are separated by a yield sign. This arrow is the yield sign. It indicates that a reaction is taking place. The arrow points toward the products of the reaction. The chemical symbols for elements are used in equations because it's quicker and easier to write the symbols than it is to write out the names of the elements. For instance, the symbol for copper is Cu. The numbers to the right of some of the element symbols in the equation indicate how many atoms of that element are present. The absence of a number means that there is only one atom. In one sulfuric acid molecule, there are two hydrogen atoms, one sulfur atom, and four oxygen atoms. Chemical equations must balance. That means whatever is represented on the left side of the equation must also be represented on the right side. The notion of a balanced equation is based on a simple principle, that atoms are neither created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction. So what goes in must come out. In this example, the left side of the equation has one copper atom, two hydrogen atoms, one sulfur atom, and four oxygen atoms. When copper and sulfuric acid react together, the products are copper sulfate and hydrogen. Now, if the equation is balanced, we should have the same number of each type of atom on the right side that we had on the left side. There is one copper, one sulfur, four oxygens, and two hydrogens. The numbers are equal, so the equation is balanced. Chemical reactions require energy in order to occur. Some chemical reactions, called endothermic reactions, must be continually provided with energy from outside in order to keep going. Other chemical reactions, called exothermic reactions, produce energy once they're started. After an exothermic reaction is started, it continues by using the energy it produces. One of the most common exothermic reactions is a combustion reaction. A combustion reaction is a reaction between oxygen and a fuel. We can see an example of a combustion reaction taking place in a boiler. A combustion reaction requires fuel, oxygen, and heat to get started. After it's started, it produces heat, which sustains the reaction, provided there's an adequate supply of fuel and oxygen. When a combustion reaction occurs, oxygen reacts with the fuel so rapidly that a fire is created. The fuel in our example is natural gas. Natural gas is mostly methane, which is a compound of carbon and hydrogen. This is the chemical equation that describes what's going on in our example. Methane is represented by the symbol CH4. This means that a methane molecule consists of one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. During this reaction, one molecule of methane reacts with two molecules of oxygen. The number two to the left of the symbol for oxygen is what tells us that two oxygen molecules are needed. The two to the right of the symbol indicates that each molecule consists of two atoms. When no number is shown, the number one is assumed. This reaction yields one molecule of carbon dioxide and two molecules of water. The symbol for carbon dioxide is CO2. The two indicates that there are two oxygen atoms. The prefix di in the word dioxide is another way of indicating the presence of these two atoms. Prefixes and suffixes are often used to identify the numbers and types of elements in a material. A replacement reaction is a chemical reaction in which one type of atom is replaced with a different type of atom. An example of a replacement reaction is the removal of dissolved mineral ions from water that is being treated in devices called demineralizers. An ion is an electrically charged atom. 
One of the dissolved minerals that's often found in water is calcium chloride. When calcium chloride is dissolved in water, it forms positively charged calcium ions and negatively charged chloride ions. Each of these types of ions can be removed by a replacement reaction. The replacement reactions can be accomplished with the aid of resins. The resins are basically strands of plastic material. Before they're used in replacement reactions, the resins are covered or charged with hydrogen ions or hydroxyl ions. A hydrogen ion is a positively charged hydrogen particle, and a hydroxyl ion is a negatively charged particle made up of oxygen and hydrogen. The calcium ions are removed by resins charged with hydrogen ions. A hydrogen ion is shown here as a white circle on a resin strand. As a calcium ion, which is shown as a red circle, passes through the resin, it pushes the hydrogen ion off of the strand and takes its place. This happens because there is a stronger attraction between the resin and the calcium ion than there is between the resin and the hydrogen ion. To represent this reaction with an equation, we can say that a calcium ion plus a hydrogen charged resin yields a hydrogen ion plus a calcium charged resin. The chloride ions are removed in the same way, except that resin charged with hydroxyl ions is used. In this reaction, a chloride ion plus a hydroxyl charged resin yields a hydroxyl ion and a chloride charged resin. When the two replacement reactions are complete, what actually remains in the water is more water. The reason for this is that a neutralization reaction occurs. In general, a neutralization reaction is a reaction in which hydrogen ions or hydroxyl ions are removed from a liquid. In this case, both hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions are removed because they react with each other to form water. Neutralization reactions are commonly used to neutralize liquids that have relatively high concentrations of hydrogen ions or hydroxyl ions. When a liquid contains a relatively high concentration of hydrogen ions, it's called an acid. When a liquid contains a relatively high concentration of hydroxyl ions, it's called an alkali or a base. The acidity or alkalinity of a liquid can be measured using a device called a pH meter. A reading of 7 on the meter indicates that the liquid is neutral. A liquid with a pH of less than 7 is acidic. The lower the number, the more acidic the liquid, that is, the higher the concentration of hydrogen ions. A liquid with a pH of greater than 7 is alkaline. The higher the reading, the more alkaline the liquid, that is, the higher the concentration of hydroxyl ions. Material balancing is a method of calculating exactly what you have to put into a process in order to produce the products that are required. If the calculations are accurate, you minimize the chances that anything will be wasted. Material balancing involves the use of chemical equations and involves two steps. When a process reaction is expressed in terms of a chemical equation, the first step in material balancing is to check the equation to make sure that it's balanced. This equation represents a reaction in which hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions react together to form water. The equation shows one oxygen and two hydrogens to the left of the yield sign, and one oxygen and two hydrogens to the right. Since both sides have the same numbers of the same types of atoms, we know the equation is balanced. The second step in material balancing is to use the balanced equation to determine the relative amounts of substances that will react with each other. For instance, in this reaction, one hydrogen ion reacts with one hydroxyl ion to form one molecule of water. In principle, 100 hydrogen ions will react with 100 hydroxyl ions to form exactly 100 molecules of water. There won't be any hydrogen or hydroxyl ions left over. If you know how many atoms, ions, and molecules there are in a reaction, you can figure out how much of each reactant you'll need and how much product will be produced. To do this, you have to know the atomic weights of all the atoms involved. That information can be found in a periodic chart of the elements. The atomic weight is shown just below the element symbol. The atomic weight is expressed in atomic mass units, or AMUs. According to this chart, an atom of hydrogen has an atomic weight of approximately one AMU. One AMU is approximately the weight of a single proton or a single neutron. Oxygen has an atomic weight of about 16 AMUs. One atom of oxygen is 16 times heavier than one atom of hydrogen. This relationship of relative weights will always hold true. 
a given number of oxygen atoms will always weigh 16 times more than the same number of hydrogen atoms. The same relationship is true for any units of weight. For example, 16 pounds of oxygen will have the same number of atoms as one pound of hydrogen. We can use the relative weights of oxygen and hydrogen to determine exactly how much oxygen we need to react with a certain amount of hydrogen to achieve a complete reaction. In a complete reaction, all of the hydrogen and oxygen are converted into water with no hydrogen or oxygen left over. An important part of material balancing is understanding the relationship between the relative weights of atoms and the actual weights of the materials used in a process reaction. To do this, let's look at an equation. This equation shows that one hydrogen ion plus one hydroxyl ion yields one molecule of water. Now, in order to use this, or any equation, to determine the actual weights of materials in a reaction, we must first determine the relative weights of the atoms. For this, we'll need a periodic table. From the table, we can determine the relative weights of the elements involved in our equation, hydrogen and oxygen. We can see that hydrogen has an atomic weight of approximately one atomic mass unit, and oxygen has an atomic weight of approximately 16 atomic mass units. So the relative weights of hydrogen and oxygen are 1 and 16. These weights can be expressed the same way using any units of weight. We'll use 1 pound for the weight of hydrogen and 16 pounds for oxygen. So 1 pound of hydrogen ions will react with 16 pounds of oxygen plus 1 pound of hydrogen or 17 pounds of hydroxyl ions to produce 18 pounds of water. But what happens if instead of 1 pound of hydrogen we have 3 pounds? Well, if we divide the actual weight of hydrogen, 3 pounds, by the relative weight of hydrogen, 1 pound, we see that the actual weight is 3 times the relative weight. This 3 becomes a multiplication factor for the equation. We'll need it to figure out how many pounds of hydroxyl ions we must have. If we multiply the relative weight of hydroxyl ions, which is 17 pounds, by the multiplication factor of 3, we see that 51 pounds of hydroxyl ions are needed to react with 3 pounds of hydrogen. And when we multiply the 18 pounds of water by 3, we see that 54 pounds of water will be produced. That's how material balances are done. Now, one way to check the math is to make sure that the total weights on each side of the equation are the same. Remember, in any reaction, what goes in has to come out. So the total weight of the reactants has to equal the total weight of the products. In this instance, there are 54 pounds of water on the right and 3 plus 51, or 54 pounds of reactants on the left. The numbers work out correctly. If the weights don't equal out, there are some things you can check. For instance, see if you included the weights of all the atoms when you were figuring up the weight of each material. Also, check to be sure that the atomic weights you used are correct. If the figures still don't work out after all that, look at your equation again. It may not be balanced. The study of chemistry can be divided into two broad areas, organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry. Organic chemistry is basically the study of chemicals that contain carbon, and inorganic chemistry is the study of everything else. Carbon is one of the most versatile elements because it can form many different types of chemical bonds with many different elements. The types of bonds that are formed determine to a great extent the physical characteristics of materials that contain carbon. For example, graphite is an example of pure carbon. It's a black powder that feels very slippery. In fact, it's so slippery that it's used as a lubricant. This is also pure carbon. It's the hardest substance known to man and one of the most precious, a diamond. It's kind of hard to believe that both of these are the same material, but they are. The atoms in carbon molecules can be arranged in several different ways. Some common arrangements include chains, branches, and rings. Carbon can also bond with many different elements. In fact, under some conditions, it can bond with as many as four different elements at once. Carbon is capable of bonding in many ways and with as many as four different elements at the same time. Because of this, naming carbon molecules is complicated. To make it easier, some chemists got together in 1892 and developed a special system for naming organic chemicals. This system is known as the Geneva Rules. The system uses different word endings, such as A-N-E and O-L, to identify different groups of molecules. For example, 
The letters A-N-E at the end of a chemical name indicate that the molecule is part of the alkane group of hydrocarbons. A hydrocarbon is a compound that contains only hydrogen and carbon. The difference between alkanes and other hydrocarbons is in the way that the carbon and hydrogen are bonded together. Three of the most common alkanes are methane, ethane, and propane. The first part of the name also has meaning. Within the alkane group, there is a connection between the first part of the name and the number of carbon atoms a molecule contains. Methane has one carbon atom, ethane has two, and propane has three. Another group of organic chemicals that has the same connection between the name and the number of carbon atoms is the alcohol group. Alcohols are formed by removing a hydrogen from a hydrocarbon and replacing it with a hydroxyl, or OH group. Methyl alcohol, which is also called methanol, has one carbon atom, while ethyl alcohol, also called ethanol, has two. The OL ending indicates that they're part of the alcohol group. We've mentioned just two groups of organic chemicals. There are many more, and a particular chemical may have more than one name. If your job involves working with organic chemicals, you should be familiar with their names. Some organic chemicals may be referred to by common names rather than scientific names. For example, wood alcohol is the common name for methanol. The atoms in carbon molecules can be arranged in several different ways. Some common arrangements include chains, branches, and rings. Carbon can also bond with many different elements. In fact, under some conditions, it can bond with as many as four different elements at once.